Welcome back on the AM show and welcome as I serve you my blunt thoughts for today titled Back to the IMF but with the same weak fundamentals. Why it won't work. Good morning Ghana 4. I know you are not so well considering where our economy is right now in a quagmire in a deep swamp of despair. Oh no 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 no. I'm not a doomsday prophet. But anyone with eyes to see will be able to tell you that even if the IMF approves our program and gives us the $3 billion we seek, it will only be the first step in a sequence of thousands of steps that must be taken to steer the ship of the economy into some sort of better place and build a solid foundation on which our economy can truly take off. I want to take you to South Korea this morning as we contemplate the example of Samsung Electronics, one of South Korea's largest chai balls. That is to say, a large family-controlled Korean business conglomerate. Samsung, in 1970, was making cheap TV sets for Sanyo. After a while, that entity started producing plasma and flat screen displays and other devices. By the middle of the 1990s, several shocks in the market which led to market turmoil for Samsung on the back of increased competition, cheaper products, and from China, excess capacity. What did Samsung do? It rode on the back of the same Asian financial crisis of 1997, a crisis though, and made a strategic shift. Samsung started producing technically superior products and invested heavily in research and development. In fact, by its 2009 fiscal year, Samsung's R&D spending had shot up to a staggering 7.6 trillion won, over $7 billion at the time. By 2014, that had doubled again to $13.4 billion, making Samsung the top-ranked R&D spender in IT globally and ranked second across all industries worldwide. The result? In 2014, Samsung was ranked number seven by Forbes in terms of the world's most valuable brands with a market cap valued at $199 billion in May 2015. The same company that struggled in the 1970s was now chilling and bum buying with the big boys in industry. I share this with you, Ghana 4, because anyone will tell you that every country is like a company, just on a much bigger scale. The same principles apply, and if you get that right, like Samsung did, you would have hit the economic bullseye. There's a whole lot Ghana can learn from the change in fortunes and progress of Samsung in terms of comparative advantage and R&D. What, I ask, uh, R&D, research and development drives as a country? How are we capitalizing on our resources and strengths in a world where finding your niche could well be your breakthrough? I'll tell you, we research nothing, develop nothing, and produce nothing. That's why we are poor. This also explains why even when we produce something, we allow others from outside to benefit more from it. Have you ever wondered why we produce the finest cocoa in Ghana in the world, yet far away Switzerland is considered the chocolate capital of the world? Have you ever thought of it? The Swiss have the enviable reputation of producing the finest quality chocolates, whether milk chocolate or dark chocolate. The point is, they got that right. Is that something we cannot do? Can we not produce enough to satisfy not just our cocoa consuming market, but those along the West African coast and even beyond to the rest of our continent? How hard is that? Can you just pause and imagine what sort of revenue that would rake in for Ghana? But no, we sit on our asses and go to the IMF and beg for what we can more than do for ourselves. So yes, the Swiss chocolates will still fill the shelves of confectionery stores from Algiers to Nouakchott and Accra to Yamoussoukro. We are clearly failing to think and exploit the advantage we have. How many of us today can even randomly decide to consume a bar of chocolate without counting the cost Look at how chocolate is expensive here. How many Ghanaians can do that? Yet Switzerland does not produce any cocoa. It's our paucity of thinking and our chronic election of leaders who can only talk big and do precious little. If all the big talk of 1D1F and planting for food and jobs and rearing for food and jobs and all those other fanciful titles given to projects had yielded much, trust me, even with COVID-19 and the Russo-Ukrainian war, all coupled with our reckless borrowing, even these, would not have been enough to sink us so low if we had got them right. Like I said though, we seem to prefer leaders who do talk talk rather than ones who would do the work work. We have been marking time since the days after Nkrumah. When are we ever going to wake up and smell the coffee? When will we put our thinking caps on and our working garb on? When? 
We cannot pay our special prosecutor and some of his staff for 16 months. Yet our president flies in luxury, happily globetrotting across the world on our account. One of the very people meant to fight corruption isn't even getting paid and some noise must be made before finally a determination is made. What a shameful country. That says a whole lot about how much of a priority the fight against corruption is for this administration, doesn't it? It does. In fact, Bloomberg, in a recent article dated December the 8th, mocked Ghana when it wrote in a story, quote, A few blocks from Ghana's state house in Accra sits a 14.5-acre parcel of prime real estate with a football field-sized hole in the middle of it. What should be emerging from the ground is the frame and sweeping concave roof of the futuristic 5,000-seat National Cathedral of Ghana. Instead, the project has stalled a victim of an economic crisis in the West African country, which was, until recently, one of the world's fastest growing economies and a magnet for foreign investment. The cathedral's original price tag of $100 million has quadrupled amid an economic crisis that has seen record inflation and the CD, the world's worst performing currency this year, lose close to 60% of its value, almost double that of Ukraine. But what really got me upset from this article was this, quote again, the cathedral is the perfect example of the spending spree. Ghana is behaving like a fabulously rich sultanate in the Gulf rather than a developing country just attaining frontier market status. In other words, Ghana 4, as a state, this implies our leaders do not know how to cut the coat of our collective prosperous aspirations according to the cloth of our available resources. This, fellow Ghanaians, is how Bloomberg jabbed this administration, and all of us for that matter. What an epic disgrace. Veranda mpo u nibi, and so ose chenchinea obanyea adre, o iwa. Look, some things simply do not make sense to me about how we choose to run our country. Why? When you consider the most populous nations in Africa, you would realize Nigeria leads with over 206 million people. Ethiopia follows with 115 million. Next is Egypt with over 102 million. Then DR Congo with over 89 million. Tanzania and South Africa share fifth spot with over 50, 59 million. Why am I highlighting this? Well, it will shock you to learn that Ghana, with a population of a little in excess of 31 million people, is the biggest importer of chicken in the whole of Africa, with 227,903 tons imported in 2021 alone. Did that sink in? Are you stunned yet? But wait, there's more. It gets even worse. According to EU data, Ghana is not just the largest importer of chicken on the continent. It has been so for the past five years. This means that since 2017, we, some 30 million people, have imported more chicken than even the countries with the largest populations on our continent. Worse still is the fact that such wholesale, unbridled, unfettered, and unthinking importation has led 80% of our poultry farms to fold up, with the remaining ones struggling to stay afloat. I'm not saying it. It's the Ghana National Association of Poultry Farmers saying it. Do you see how truly reckless and careless we are? Do you see now why I say going to the IMF is meaningless unless it is firmly tied to sound spending and e economy boosting pro programs moving forward? These misleaders are the reckless bunch we keep electing. And as my senior KSM will say, these leaders think analog when the world has gone digital. How then can such a crop of people with antiquated ideas lead us into the promised land? Ghanaians, wake up all. Wake up! Else we shall continue to see our economy play buga with us. Oh, lo, 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 buga, oh, eh, buga. I do not know when our finance minister is going to stop sounding like some new and eager Christian convert trying to proselytize others. But his incessant biblical quotations and allusions are becoming increasingly annoying for some of us. I'm not the devil, no. But I'm simply saying if you get people into such a tight scrape, even being the good Christian you purport to be, Mr. Finance Minister, you don't solve the problem by slinging Bible verses at us. Someone please tell him why he's still at post, thanks to Mr. President's pussyfooting, for which only God knows why, to spare us the Bible slapping and get down to fixing our economy. I mean, we tolerate too much hogwash in this country, really. The current cost of a loaf of bread, a loaf of bread is above the minimum wage and even more than the new minimum wage plan for next year. And all we can do is lift verses from the Bible and celebrate as simply getting a staff level agreement from the IMF. Ah, well, I guess while some shoot for the stars and beyond, there will always be others shooting for the top of some cathedral. All I'm trying to say, Ghana 4, is this. 
if we shall change our fortunes as a country. We need to cease with this asinine tendency of voting into office inept leaders who only blow hot air, period. But as I end, let me just paint for you the true picture of where we are today. Come with me. This is a picture of Ghana's IMF bailout package. The level we've reached, staff level, program amount three billion, program type, an extended credit facility, and the program duration, three years. That means if this administration is not in power, just as the previous administration did, it would have hobbled another administration with its failure. Let's get to our next slide. The extended credit facility provides financial assistance to countries with protracted balance of payment problems. That's exactly where we are. Then you go to our next slide. Ghana's overall balance of payments position. Look at where we've shot up from. In February 2022, we're at just 935 million. By June, we had hit 2.5 billion. By September, 3.4 billion in terms of our overall balance of payment. Look at that within just a few months. Now, according to Finance Minister Keno Friata, on average, Ghana's import bill exceeds $10 billion annually and is accounted for by a diverse range of items that include iron, steel, aluminium, sugar, rice, fish, poultry, palm oil, cement, fertilizers, pharmaceuticals, toilet roll. Yes, you heard right. Toilet roll. Toothpicks, fruit juices. What a country. When you look at Ghana's import bill, look at the drivers. Now, just look at that. Total import, 683,709 tons of chicken. 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 Brazil and the U.S. contribute 455,806 tons. The EU, 227. That is the general output. But according to the Ghana National Association of Poultry Farmers, like I mentioned, 80% of poultry ventures in Ghana have folded up due to this importation of frozen chicken. And if you look at the allocation for planting for food and jobs 2023, look at that, 660 million. Yet how much are we expending on other things? Rearing for Food and Jobs is an initiative under the Planting for Food and Jobs. 120,000 layer birds were distributed to 1,000 poultry farmers. Each farmer also received a 120 capacity battery cage to house the birds. That's what we were told. This is what we were told. 120,000 layer birds distributed to them. But let's, let's move on to the next slide. The question is, with all this huge level of investment, where are the results? Results nowhere here. Unlike Samsung, we have empty hands. In fact, we are importing more, more. So as I end, I just want to let us contemplate these matters. My name is Benjamin Akapo. I say all these because I'm extremely passionate about Amagana and what her future, intricately tied to ours, holds. These are my blunt thoughts for you, served raw, hot, unedited, undiluted. God richly bless our motherland and make her great and strong.